Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Thursday, everybody. Today there are several major economic developments we need to cover. But first, the full text of the revised party constitution from the 20th Party Congress has been released. So let's go through this first. One of the most interesting details in the party constitution is that the so-called two establishers, Liangge Chueli, has not been incorporated into the document. But the so-called two safeguards, Liangge Weihu, have been. The two safeguards are to firmly uphold the authority and centralize unified leadership of the Central Committee, with Comrade Xi Jinping at the core. And we remember that the two establishers are one, and now quoting the language of the party's own documents, to establish the status of Comrade Xi Jinping as the core of the party's Central Committee and of the whole party, and two, to establish the guiding role of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for the new era. The inclusion of one. And not the other is curious. Analysts are still debating what exactly this means, and frankly, yours truly is scratching his head on this one. Some argue that this shows that there is still some pushback against Xi within senior leadership. Others disagree, saying that perhaps the two safeguards basically covers both concepts, and thus is a more succinct way of incorporating the concepts. The problem with this argument, however, is that the two establishers includes the quote guiding role of Xi Jinping thought end quote that is ideology, which is not included in the two safeguards. The inclusion of one and not the other thus remains an open question. State media has also made a big deal about the party constitution, including the statement, quote, "Holding dear humanity's shared values of peace, development, fairness, justice, democracy, and freedom," end quote, which Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin informed international reporters at a press conference, quote, "reflects the deep sense of commitment and responsibility of Chinese communists to the common good of the world and humanity." End quote. On Tuesday this week, Xi's new Politburo also met for the first time. After the meeting, the supreme seven-person body held its first study session on quote, guiding principles from the 20th Party Congress. End quote. Meanwhile, the new membership of the larger 205-person Central Committee, a type of in-party policy-making body, is organizing similar study sessions across the country, in companies, local communities, universities, and military bases. While we are on party matters, there are a few diplomatic updates to touch on too. With the recent Party Congress, we learned that China's top diplomat and foreign policy official, Yang Jiechi, will be retiring. To be replaced with the current Foreign Minister Wang Yi, Wang has joined the 24-member Politburo as of Sunday. It looks like Qin Gang, the People's Republic of China ambassador to the United States, will be China's Foreign Minister. Though this has not been confirmed, what would be notable about such an appointment is that Qin would be the first incumbent ambassador to be promoted directly to full membership of the Communist Party Central Committee since the Mao era. So this is also a development to keep our eyes on. Now, one last thing: the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam will pay an official visit to China from October 30th to the 2nd of November, at the invitation of General Secretary Xi Jinping himself. Making him the first foreign leader to visit China after the 20th Party Congress and the start of Xi's third term in power. Next up, we of course cannot forget that sporadic outbreaks and resulting lockdowns continue to taunt officials and residents into this week, with some major cities inching closer to painful large-scale lockdowns. Yesterday, Wednesday, the capital closed the Universal Beijing Resort Amusement Park due to COVID concerns. Districts, including one with almost one million people in the economically important centers of Wuhan and Guangzhou, have also been locked down this week. Shanghai found several community cases this week too, tightening restrictions, but with lockdowns in the mega city remaining focused and small scale. Shanghai has become the first city in China too to provide its residents with inhaled COVID-19 vaccine boosters, writes state media yesterday. According to local authorities, 12 million residents have taken them as of Tuesday this week. Cases across the country continue to grow too, with new daily infection rates 
uh, once again climbing into their thousands. But on the COVID and lockdown front, there are some cautiously optimistic stories too. US-based Wall Street Journal reports that China is signaling easing of COVID-19 restrictions for foreign businesses, writing that in a notice that outlined policies to attract more foreign investment into its manufacturing sector. The government asked local authorities to facilitate multinational companies' executives, technicians and their families to travel into China. The notice, published Tuesday on the National Development and Reform Commission's website, also encouraged bringing world-class talent into the country. It urged local authorities to support multinational companies to set up research and development centers in China and to deepen scientific and technological openness and collaboration. In reading this, we should be cautious, however. While these are indeed good messaging and good signs, there is no specific plan or direction to reduce the tightness at the border. However, this week also, Bloomberg's Hong Kong team reports that Chinese airlines plan to increase international flights from this weekend, writing that China plans to increase the number of international flights operated by domestic and foreign airlines to 840 a week from October 30th through to the 25th of March. Quote, it's a jump of 106% from October 2021 to late March this year, but still well below pre-pandemic levels. End quote. Next up, the Chinese economy. Hey guys, if you like what I'm doing here with China Update and you'd like to help me keep China Update sustainable, allow me to continue making these episodes for you guys every day. Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. This is a huge help if you are able to go that extra mile to support the channel. If you're enjoying today's episode in particular, don't forget to hit the like button. And as always, thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Okay, first for the economy, Beijing continues to intervene in the currency through its state banks. Multiple outlets over the last few days are reporting, citing unnamed sources, that major Chinese state-owned banks sold US dollars in both onshore and offshore markets in late trading on Tuesday to prop up the weakening yuan. It's believed that the selling of dollars by state banks in early U.S. trading hours lifted the RMB. Of course, we've been witnessing the Chinese currency giving way to downside pressure in recent weeks, with the onshore yuan hitting the weakest level since December 2007. One source, speaking to UK-based Reuters, told the outlet that it was unusual for domestic branches of China's big banks to be active in onshore trades during London or New York trading hours. Although they have normally dealt in offshore yuan, and used its moves to steer the onshore counterpart. The outlet adds that the offshore yuan has been hitting successive record lows in recent sessions, reflecting a strengthening dollar and worries over a slowing Chinese economy, and that Chinese regulators have been busy rolling out measures to stem fast yuan depreciation. And the measures may be working too. At least for now. Yesterday, Wednesday, the beleaguered RMB surged by a record against the US dollar, joining a broad rally against the dollar as the market bets that the US Federal Reserve rate hikes may be moderating. To be continued. Next up, Forsan International Limited, one of China's largest private conglomerates, a debt-laden player which we've been following with some concern for months now, has told analysts that it aims to sell as much as 11 billion US dollars of assets in the next 12 months. According to analysts at Citigroup Inc., who attended a briefing with the company on Monday, the conglomerate's management plans to divest 50 billion to 80 billion RMB, 6.9 billion to 11 billion US dollars, of non core assets, quote, as it works to focus on its consumer discretionary business. End quote. We remember that Shanghai based Fosun has been under investor scrutiny regarding its liquidity since Moody's Investor Service warned in June that the conglomerate was facing funding pressures. Things were made worse when Beijing regulators warned state run financial institutes to reduce exposure to the mega firm. This week on Tuesday, Moody's lowered its rating for Fosun a step deeper into junk territory, and some of Fosun's notes are trading for less than 50 cents on the dollar very much in distress territory. And finally, we have new observations from our often quoted China finance expert Michael Pettis from this week. I wanted to include these in yesterday's video, but the sector on the economy was already quite long, so I decided to end today's video with it. Quote, the problems in the Chinese economy, surging debt, an insolvent banking system, widespread moral hazard, a huge over-reliance on investment in non-productive infrastructure and property, punishingly low consumption rates, etc., were not created under Xi. These were problems that evolved over the past two decades. Recent policy choices under Xi may have affected the pace of growth at the margin, 
but they were often more than consequences of these underlying imbalances than the cause. The slowdown was inevitable. This matters, and not just in terms of assigning blame. If China's current slowdown was caused by policy mistakes made in the past two to three years, it can be reversed by reversing these policy mistakes. If, on the other hand, China's current slowdown is the consequence of the deep distortions in China's income distribution, then the only way to resolve them and to reverse the unsustainable build-up in debt requires that these imbalances be resolved. I've noted before that policymakers during the bubble phase of an economy always seem brilliant, and they always seem incompetent when the bubble begins to deflate, even though it was the former that caused the latter. I think we are seeing that story repeat. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I will see you all tomorrow.